Um, once again, I feel very honored to, to be invited to speak about uh, some of the latest uh, additions to, um, to medical education. Um, this can be a little bit complex, but uh, my goal is just to introduce the idea to you. Um, it's, it can uh, give you an answer for, for some of the questions we're asked all day. And also I share with you the experience how we started the competence committee. And as I mentioned, I was honored to design the first competence committee at my university and to be the designer of the CBD for my specialty. First thing, information is not a knowledge. So again, I'll give you the idea, you take it from there and you process it and make it knowledge. So if, I, if you take the term competence committee and you go home and, and read about it, that's, that's a very uh, important gain for me on the purpose of the lecture. The second thing, this is not a fiction. It's, it's now being practiced in Canada. We, we work with this, so it's not a theory. Um, so my goal is to um, uh, walk, walk you through uh, why did we need the competence committee, the role of the competence committee, the structure, who should sit on that committee, and the channels of communication where we actually put the competence committee in an existing structure. So why did we need the competence committee? This is a nice read for someone who likes to read books called The Wisdom of Crowds. This is not specific to medical education, but basically uh, the, the author is focusing on how large groups of people can be actually smarter and come up with smarter decisions than just an individual smart uh, decision. So he uh, speaks about the, uh, the theory of collective intelligence. This is another nice concept. You can read about it, and especially in medical education, it's called collective intelligence. Um, there's so many articles about uh, they studied how group decisions and how uh, they can be more beneficial and fair. And uh, that, I, mean, I use the word fair. Uh, because uh, sometimes the subjectivity may not be fair to the students. And uh, so there's so many uh, articles there. The bottom line of all of them is that group conversation is more likely to uncover deficiencies among students than an individual, um, individual decision. And I think uh, our brother from Sudan mentioned about their experience with orthopedic and how they increased the number of examiners. They came up with better results there. Now, the another reason why we needed the competence committee, as you know, CBME is the biggest change in 100 years in medical education. So everybody's now talking about CBME. In Canada, we call it CBD competence by design because we branded it. That's the only difference, but it's, it's the same concept. And with CBME, there's a huge increase in the number of assessments. There are a huge increase in the types of assessments. And we were busy before CBME. So the, the core training committee was busy. I, when, I, when I was a program director, I received 50, 60 emails a day. I'm not exaggerating. And I have to work through 90 consultants and uh, tw 35 residents. So I can't, I can't take the extra work. So that, that's why they needed a special group to go through the assessments. Now, so we, we agreed that we needed multiple assessments, multiple raters, by, and multiple context. Uh, and um, I used to uh, use the Mona Lisa picture before. I think some of you may have attended my talks and how we, we know that's Albert Einstein because previous experience. But if you, you can't define this person if you, if you see them the first time. And this is exactly what we see in our graduates, either, either medical schools or postgraduate medical education. We know that after the undergrad, this is a doctor. After a board exam, a specialist. Do we really can make the difference between the candidates? I don't think so with the existing structures. So basically by adding multiple assessments, multiple raters, and multiple contexts, we add more pixels to the picture. So we, we, see, we see it better. The second thing is what we call the steep T theory there, where we throw the students or the, or the doctor in the training environment. We say five years, come to us, we'll give you a summative exam, and you're a doctor, you're a specialist. Do we know exactly what's going on in, inside the, the, the hot water there? We don't. The third one is another reason is because one person may get the picture wrong. So you need multiple people. Sometimes you, even if the picture is not clear, they may give you very uh, fair and close decision, even if it's not perfect. 
failure to fail. It's very well known in medical education. If I give you more assessments, if I give you more information, I think your job will be much easier to fail somebody. Um, again, spoon feeding is not the goal. It's gone. It's an old tradition, and we should deviate from it. And that's where you need the multiple assessment and multiple rectors, multiple context. Uh, again, with with the focus on the non-technical skills, soft skills, they're all the same name, or can meds. So soft skills, non-technical skills, can meds, they, they mean the same, exactly the same. These ones are the hardest to teach and assess. If you give you a curriculum, a, a, a chapter in a book, I think you, every, everyone here, it's easy to uh, extract questions out of it. But to test someone's attitude, behavior, time management, resource management, leadership, communication, collaboration, scholarly, how they critically appraise article, how they design research, those are the hardest one. And if you uh, collect more information, again, they will be easier to, uh, uh, to assess. Now, the other thing we, we shifted from is to use the assessments for, for teaching, for learning, instead of just to hunt the mistakes or to decide pass or fail. Now, again, I want to reflect on what's going on in our country here, so, and especially with the postgraduate medical education, we use a summative test, one summative test to declare competency. And I think this is time, and I repeated this before, it's time to change this. The Canadians, they changed the board exam to its assessment tools. If you, I think this morning somebody mentioned quickly the, 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 the stages of training. The Canadian board exam is within the training program now. So they come back to the system and they have to prove in a stage called transition to practice stage that they are consultants, they are specialists. So the focus in a summative test, I think it, it needs to be changed uh, here in our country. Types of assessments, there's so many here. I'm giving you... So what, what, what's going on here? We, we have training. I don't think we have training, but let's say we have training because we don't have uh, clear curriculums. It's not practice it. We don't have an assessment. Um, and then at the end, people enter the exam in, in, in a summative uh, questions. And that's the summative questions and summative test is the main determinant of the, of the competency. This has to change. That's my point, and we can discuss it later because I have 20 minutes. So you have to, you have to, uh, you have to uh, subtract the two minutes. <laughs> yeah. So the O score, and I, I'll, I'll highlight the O score. I'm not going to mention all of the assessment and new assessment tools. You can read them. The number of assessments. I, this is important because it may answer some of the questions about the technology this morning. This is a real life example. It happened to me in 2017. So when we moved from years of training to stages, we design it EPAs. EPA is entrustable professional activity. It has milestones, it has assessment tools, and there is a required number of observation to achieve, achieved observation. So for the first stage, tra TTD, transition to discipline, you need nine observations. For foundation, you need 115 for each student, for each trainee. Now, the total is 295 multiplied by 35 trainees. We figured out in five years, we need 10,000 assessments. Again, those are the achieved. So those trainees most likely will, will have the same number, EPAs, because it's, it's formative assessments, and they're not achieved. And that's where we needed the electronic systems here. The goal to, I'm, I'm taking you back to the, uh, Einstein picture. The goal is to add more pixels by adding more types and numbers to see the pictures more clearly there. Now, this is the O score. The bulk of assessment, the bulk of the 10,000s, probably this score. And this is one of the few validated uh, uh, assessment tools. It's called O score or Ottawa score. And basically, it's very quick, easy to be, uh, uh, to be performed by the teacher. It has five scales and very easy to go through it. There's no time for me to go through all of it, but this is the bulk of the assessments will be this one here. Now, what are the challenges now we had here? Um, I didn't do this, 
So that's just a different computer, okay. And so the first one is too much, too much subjectivity, the first one, okay. And we have too many assessments, we agreed. We have too much work for the core training committee and it's difficult to make decisions because we didn't have enough information. And we didn't have time to make the on-time assessment. And it was mentioned nicely in one of the talks today is that the, the importance of having the assessment right on time, not after or before. And that's where we needed the competence committee. The, whole, the entire slides changed, so I apologize. But the, the, this is where we needed the group of people to go through all of these and come up with recommendations, not even decisions, as I will explain. This is another nice way for the electronic and computer systems to give the community an easy way to, um, um, to, to make decisions. So it's called SpiderNet or rather Plot. And it, this, the current softwares we use, they can do this. So if you have 200 assessments for the same person, and if you look carefully around the circle, around the SpiderNet, there's prof is professionalism. Uh, for example, com is communication, uh, the knowledge, okay? And the red is the expectation, or you can make it as the class average. So by, by in one second, by quick look, I know that this candidate is, has a problem with the knowledge, is below average, and communication compared to everybody else. So just by, this is a sum of hundreds, can be hundreds, can be tens of uh, assessments. And it's, it's been in use now. Now, compass community structure, membership, chair, and we advise that the chair is not the same of the uh, chair for the uh, tr uh, tra core training committee, completely independent. The program director or the main, uh, main person in charge of the program, we make them non-voting members because we, we don't need the bias. So they it can be very fair. The associate program director is there. The primary reviewer is a new position. This, those are the people who, who review the profile and present them uh, um, at the committee and I'd explain their role. The program administrator, this is the secretary. And now this is the very interesting one. There's a lot of discussions about bringing people from outside the, either the hospital, the specialty, the medicine to be members in the competence committee. And you can see it may look bizarre it may be not very clear, but you can bring another program director from another specialty or another university, or you can bring a nurse, a, a other healthcare professionals, or any surgeon, for example, to anesthesia and so on, or a public member. And this is where the debate is, and you can see a lot of publications about this. If, if the aim is to provide service to the public, why not to have a public member at the competence committee? Um, now, the primary reviewer, quickly, I'm going to go th through the things that the program reviewer can do. Review the trainee's portfolio, present it at the meeting, also contribute to the discussions and with all trainees, and communicate with the academic advisors. Now, this is another uh, newer position. We used to have academic advisors, but now their role is a little bit different. So, they, um, they actually supervise academically the candidate. They can have up to four, but you can have the number you want. And then they, they help the trainee to reflect on feedback. They sit with them. They come up with, um, with uh, learning plans. They, uh, they give the advice and they're the link between the competence committee and the candidate. And uh, again, this is the learning plan and they make recommendations to the competence committee. Now, so I'm going to, with this diagram, uh, show you where the competence committee in the structure there. So if you need the reference, it's there, but I, I tried to make it a little bit simpler. So this is the competence committee. This is the learners group. And between them is the academic advisors, okay? And the communication goes back and forth between them there. Now, the trainers or the faculty or the teachers they have direct interactions. The more you have, the better it is for the competence committee. You have other assessments. So you can have a logbook, for example, or you, you can have a, a summative, uh, a written exam, an oral exam. They all go, go to the same uh, circle there. So the first circle in the learner, we call it as information production. 
And when it comes to the competence <laughs> committee, that's where the information is being used there. And then the e-portfolio will be uh, made by the academic advisor and the, and the student and goes to the competence committee, goes back to the, the other learning uh, circle with a learning plan. Again, the core training committee is the one who makes decision at the end. Um, uh, th these are the type of decisions we make at the competence committee. So number one is progressing as expected. You just monitor, you don't do much. Or you, if they're doing well, you can give them room to do more. So a lot of people there ahead, don't stop them from going ahead. You know, they can be creative. I had a residence who published five, six articles a day, uh, <laughs> uh, a year. And that's more than the average, even faculty there. So if, if he's doing well in his study, make him publish more, help him. Uh, or somebody has a special interest in, in a special skill also. So the creativity, you have to enhance the creativity. Not progressing as expected, that's where you need learning plans and sometimes it goes too far for remediations. Progress is accelerated, those are the people who are really ahead. And I spoke about that, failure to progress Again, that's another problem there where you need, uh, sometimes you may need even to stop trainees. And we did. So uh, uh, there's no um, sympathy for uh, when, you, when you assess people in the right way. And if you think that this candidate, if you give them the, the label specialist, they can't take care of our families and you pass them, that's our mistake there. There's no sympathy when it comes to delivering healthcare. And the goal is not to graduate people. The goal is to give the right care to the right people. So we're all responsible if we graduate someone who we know that they're not competent. That's our, our fault there. Um, An active, that's another, if people go for maternity or paternity leave or so on. Summary. The quickly, so. It's a subcommittee, it's not an independent committee. And it collects and makes very robust review of the assessments and, and uh, residence performance. The goal is to ensure all residents achieve requirements on time, the membership we spoke about, and the pop, I, I forget to write here the uh, other, the outside members, but you can. Uh, the meetings, the early, as you can have as many as you want two to three meetings. And the, by the way, the competence committee meetings, they can go very long, hours and hours sometimes, because of the debate. Um, the assessment data, those are this all assessment tools you can, um, you can have them to help the competence committee make decisions. Uh, the process and how primary reviewers are responsible for reviewing the uh, candidates' uh, data and connect with the academic advisor and the decision is how they can be made and the confidentiality and that's a big topic when it comes to medical education in general not just competence committee and recording on documentation which especially people who are uh, interested in accreditation you need to document everything there so thank you very much